Hello, everyone. Today's talk will be the last Chris Noon lecture until much, but please join us for Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies lectures co-sponsored co by Chris on Monday, February 11 at 4 p.m. in this room that will be given by Pavel Koval, uh, a member of the European Parliament from Poland. His lecture will explore Ukraine between Russia and the EU. Our next Greece Noon lecture will be on Wednesday, March 13. Uh, Vladimir Desmineanu, professor of comparative politics at the University of Maryland, will speak on understanding radical evil, communism and fascism as open wounds. Professor Desmineanu will give a second lecture on Tuesday, March 12 at 4 p.m. in this room on de-democratization in Romania, question mark, addressing the turbulent year 20, uh, 2012. It's my great pleasure to introduce Irina Aristarchova, Associate Professor of Art and Design. Irina uh, received her PhD in Social Theory, Institute of Sociology, Russian Academy of Science, Moscow, in 1999. Uh, she has held faculty positions at the Pennsylvania State University, National University in Singapore, and La Salle College on, of the Arts. She joined the School of Art uh, Art and Design faculty as an associate professor in 2012. So Irina is our new colleague. Irina's book, His, uh, Hospitality of the Matrix, Philosophy, Biomedicine, and Culture, was published in 2012 <coughs> uh, by Columbia University Press. She writes on hospitality, space, matrix, and new media. Her numerous other publications include Ectogenesis and Mother as machine, as in parentheses, and a chapter in the volume Collectivism After Modern Modernism, The Act of Social Imagination After 1945, published in 2007. Please join me in welcoming Irina to our community and as, a sp as our speaker today. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Majorova, and it's my incredible pleasure to um, be here today. Um, just now we couldn't make uh, any of the videos work, so we even contemplated that it's probably been blocked by the KGB, right? So <laughs> a long hand of the KGB uh, might prevent me from showing some of the videos of Pussy Riot. Um, this talk brings together, and it's pretty experimental and initial, so any of your questions would be very much welcome. And it brings together uh, two of, of my interests, right? One is in contemporary art, and another one is in feminist theory. And so I very much appreciate Kress for giving me this opportunity. And I will rely uh, more specifically on uh, two strands in my research, one on, on women, art, and government in Bolshevik Russia, and another one on the text, Collectivism After Modernism, Collective Action in Post-Soviet Russia that compares the work of um, Moscow actionist Anatoly Asmolovsky and other uh, Moscow artists of the 1990s with the actions and methodologies of the Committee of Soldiers' Mothers. Now, um, the phenomenon of pussy riot has become global, and um, I must confess that no one expected it. About year after year, I call my friends, curators and artists in Moscow, and ask them, so what's up with, the, with feminism? And year after year, it's like, forget about it. You're never going to see it. Forget about you know, your feminist interests. And um, in that sense, the fact that Pussy Riot has become such a global phenomenon and has achieved what many of the um, uh, groups could not achieve and probably the only uh, group of contemporary culture, cultural production which has become known outside of the country. Uh, it represents a new situation for various groups involved in it. 
artists, political activists, Ru the Russian church itself, Russian government, and it touched, as we um, usually say, ordinary people. Uh, as a scholar, I was reluctant to jump on the bandwagon of the Pussy Riot for a while, uh, though um, doing research on them, and it's my mother, in a way, who convinced me uh, to, to do that. Um, when I asked her, uh, what, what do these ordinary Russians think about it? I said, Mom, at your country house at the duchy in summer, do, what do you say? What do you talk, talk about when, you, uh, w when they were on trial last summer? And my mom said, yeah, of course we talk about them. They are such bad mothers. And um, and it made me feel angry because <laughs> I practically never saw my mother, right? In my childhood, my mother was a typical Soviet mother. She had three children and she was never at home. She had to work. So her charge of these young uh, women, two of whom who were in trial are mothers, kind of made me feel that I am going to write this. I am going to do research on this because there is something um, in this, what specifically needs to be addressed from a uh, feminist point of view, as a so Soviet and post-Soviet context. And it's also something, I think, unique that the Soviet experience and post-Soviet experience with gender relations can contribute. And there are very few people, actually, who are um, doing work in that for a variety of reasons, which we can discuss here, too. Um, after all, as during the trial been said, feminism is seen. But why? Um, many anecdotal parallels have been made um, since then. Associating Pussy Riot with female saints, and probably you've seen some of the images where they presented as Madonnas, um, to famous Russian women revolutionaries who were charged, jailed, or even executed in the imperial Russia for their political actions. And <laughs> Ekaterina Dogut, one of the uh, most prominent Russian art criti critics, uh, said that maybe the work itself doesn't mean m very much, but surely uh, those young women looked like Vera Zasulich when they were sitting there behind bars. And, and that history of the 19th century persecutions of nihilists and other revolutionary women are, are being brought up. Despite of the uh, attempts also to downplay their intelligence and present these um, young women as simple, stupid girls who didn't know what they were doing. They had no idea. The, um, it became quickly clear when we go further and look at, at who they are, that the work is extensive and well-planned, and especially their politics, and as I would argue, especially their gender politics. Uh, Maria Lohina said, frankly, I consider the charges against me absurd because I live in a secular state and I am a citizen of that secular state. Uh, what I will try and do here today is to argue that we are living, we are participating, including today, in the production of the totally new situation as far as uh, post-Soviet um, woman is concerned. And in many ways that this particular production is a continuation uh, of that artist, woman, citizen triad. Uh, so. Let me see if it will work. It's a little bit slow. <coughs> there were many anonymous members of the group, and the group was supposed to remain anonymous. So when the court uh, case happened as a result of this specific work, uh, three of the members were charged. And we know names of three of them for sure. And um, uh, uh, now briefly about who they are. Uh, Maria Alokhina was born in Moscow in 1988, right? So mo all of them are in their um, early mid-20s. She writes poetry, studied journalism and literature, and participated in the Christian volunteering work with sick children. 
and also in Greenpeace. So from all three of them, she's a mostly environmentalist um, activist. She has a five-year-old son who now lives with her mother and also supported by her partner. Nadezhda Tolakonnikova was born in 1989 in Norilsk. And before her ar arrest, she was studying in Moscow State University Philosophy Department. Her honors thesis was supposed to be titled, or is titled, and this is translation from Russian, Technologies of the Deconstruction of a Subject in the Philosophy of Gender Relations. Right? Um, I have a paper in my bag with a rough terminology of the same sort, which I'm supposed to review for a feminist philosophy journal. Right. Uh, philosophy department could not find a supervisor for her in Moscow, and she had to look outside of that department, Not even though things changed, but not much changed in the philosophy department, which I attended right, 20 years ago. <coughs> um, she claims that she's interested <coughs> in queer theory, um, and... Judith Butler, Rosie Braidotti, and Elizabeth Gross. And those of you who are interested in feminist theory or in public um, uh, intellectuals in this country, you would know that these names are some of the key names in um, uh, questions of gender. Before this work, she was a member of the Art Actionist Group War that won a prestigious award in contemporary art in Moscow She's also mother of a young child, and I'll speak a little bit more about that group, uh, the war. The third member who was charged and later released, Ekaterina Samutsevich, was born in 1982 in Moscow. She graduated from Moscow Energy Institute and worked for a while in the defense industry as a software developer. She then freelanced and subsequently studied uh, new media art at the newly established Rochenka Art School in Moscow. Um, Rochenka, who is a partner of Varvara Stepanova, whom I will be talking about later. Under supervision of Alexey Shulgin, and again, um, he's um, a well-known in new media art circles and was part of our um, community of new media for a very long time. For her final project, she developed a subversive web browser. It was called in English, subversive web browser. And she's a well-known member of LGBT um, rights activism, which is pretty unusual for any of the previous groups, um, whether political or artistic. Samutsevich and Tolokonikov also did an in-court performance during the famous trial of the exhibition, um, which was called Forbidden Art. The trial against that exhibition happened in 2009, and there were trials before that. So they were, they were sitting in the same court in which they were protesting other artists who were charged a few years before that. So... Um, in October 2011, they gave a lecture when... Uh, that's how Pussy Riot group was formed. There were very uh, few groups formed, and uh, Pussy Riot group announced uh, about itself to the world in October 2011 when they gave a lecture on the topic of punk feminist art, which was called Kill the Sexist, Wash Away His Blood, <laughs> under the group title Pussy Riot. Right? And those of you who know Russian, uh, who don't know Russian, between peace and pussy, and it was it was a kind of the word peace means a little bit like pussy in in Russian. And they also went to demonstrations to defend um, a forest near Moscow, which would be taken out uh, by a construction project, um, uh, Himkinsky Les, and they defended LGBT and and feminist causes as well. They claimed that what inspired them was Viennese actionism, uh, street art, and feminist punk rock. Right? So in case if you don't know feminist punk rock, it's on the right side. It's part of the 90s movement Riot Girls. And again, thanks to Pussy Riot, many more people know about groups like Bikini Kill today. Um, globally, and um, they 
they cite them as one of, including Guerrilla Girls as well on the right, as one of the inspirations for their work, which is part of an argument which I'm making of this new post-Soviet uh, uh, female identity. It's a very new generation. It's much more global. It's inscribed within, and it borrows not only from its own previous history, but from the global uh, histories of um, dissent. Um, Putin, they write on their, in their programmatic um, document, is a symbol of patriarchal power and sexism. <coughs> and um, I would like to now show a video, if we will manage, um, of a prayer in a church which started the whole Pussy Riot trial. Just a little bit a part of it. It was very, very short. I spare you the sound, even though we don't have a sound, but I spare you the sound. So that was it. They, they went on stage. As you can see that um, this particular place on stage, which is the altar, it's a, it's a space where women are not supposed to go, right? Not just in Christianity, but in many other religions. It's only a place for, of um, a priest and the church prayer. And also, I'll say a few words about this particular space, because it was chosen as they are saying, um, because it, this particular church <coughs> this particular church, which was built anew as a symbol of uh, renewed uh, Russia, right? That was destroyed during the Soviet times and then rebuilt um, it, it actually does not belong to the Russian Orthodox Church. It belongs to a Moscow uh, city government. And often what happens is that it, it has a fantastic sound system and lots of um, uh, government events take place there and then they are uh, broadcast to, uh, on TV. Right. So apart from govern, uh, government events, they also rent this place out and uh, you can have presentations, commercial presentations, <coughs> like, for example, this this space you see on the left is a part of this uh, large uh, church compound. On the right, you see there was a presentation of um, Virtu, very elite cell phone where a lot of alcohol was flowing and some of our American actors made the stop there. So um, it was important for Pussy Riot that this particular space is being um, profiled, so to speak. And they are writing that this is a government-run house and not even part of the Russian Orthodox Church. Right? This is a ha house of... a. Uh, uh, Moscow Patriarch Kirill, who is now a friend with Putin. So what they did there, that they created a prayer which words were addressed to the Mother Mary. And this is, again, a typical part of a long-term history of praying to Mother Mary in Russia, which were, they were taking over, uh, specifically not to God, but to, not to Jesus Christ, but to Mother Mary. When there is nothing else left, people pray to Mother Mary, <laughs> right? And they were asking Mother Mary, not just become a feminist, they asked that, but they were also asking Russia to, uh, Mother Mary to help them get rid of Putin. Um, what, what they say about them as a mission that now the artist is just a dude who does what he does. And then there is a discourse about it, public discussion. This is half of our job. We are only to push towards something else. And what we want is a revolution. Uh, there have been 
lots of strong responses to uh, their work. Some of these responses claim that um, uh, connected them to this history. Other responses uh, were more aesthetic, of aesthetic nature, and a couple of major um, art historians and cultural um, theorists connected their aesthetic to uh, Kazimir Malevich's work, specifically these paintings from this period, as um, them using those his colors and that, that aesthetic. You can see why others um, are writing about Russian avant-garde or feminist art movement. And there have been some very strong responses uh, which described whom they offended and what they offended. And I will read one of those responses. It's a family activist, family values activist. What Pussy Riot want is to destroy the foundations of our nation. After they deconstruct their own gender, Pussy Riot will lead other women and girls to become critics of their own sex, destroying and changing its <coughs> boundaries, losing sexual form, expanding their experience, corrupting each other, men and children, and disallowing alternative opinions. And the key to this destruction is gender. This is why Pussy Riot are so educated about this gender, much more than even members of our parliament. Their spear is heading right into the heart of the church, and the name of this spear is gender equality. How does one situate the work of Pussy Riot within the history of women's situation in art and politics in Russia? And this is not only uh, a simple theoretical question, but it's also one of important historical consequences. Who are the Pussy Riot, the generation that is both connected to the global young women's movement, but also to that generation of Varvara Stepanova? After all, many of references that appeared in the Russian circles referred to the Russian avant-garde. Um, one of them was studying uh, in an art school named after Alexander Rochenka. But we should frame I also, I believe, the question even wider and deeper. Who is this post-Soviet woman artist risking all for the sake of her political choice as a citizen? And here it's where I turn to Varvara Stepanova, and I will use her work in early Soviet Russia to provide me with an opportunity also to address some of the changes which were happening to women or on a part of and from the loss of the early Bolshevik government. After all, this was also the time when an idea of a new man and a new woman appeared, a woman who was not longer to be supposed to be bound by her private circumstance, and she was supposed to be liberated economically, politically, culturally, and sexually, <coughs> just like Pussy Riot. Varvara Stepanova was born in Komna, Lithuania, then part of the Russian Empire in 1894. She moved to Kazan, where she studied at the local art school, moving to Moscow before ending her studies. She was 23 when the Bolshevik Revolution took place in Russia in 1917, so roughly the age of a Pussy Riot women. By 1920, when she was 26, she was involved in many of the new governmental uh, professional organizations that were working towards this new art culture and whose members would later become known as the Russian avant-garde. Udaltsova, Malevich, Razanova, Mirholt, Maikovsky, Eisenstein, Popova, Gan, Rochenka, Tatlin, and others. She was the first scientific secretary of the Institute of Artistic Culture, a board member of the visual arts section of the Union of Art Workers, Vice Director of the Literary Artistic Sector of the Visual Arts Department of Anarchan Pros, loosely translated the First People's Commission, <coughs> uh, Ministry of Culture and Education, headed by Anatoly Lunacharsky, as well as a member of the Institute of this Art Culture. She was also a faculty member. She became a full professor of the Visual Arts Studio in the Academy of Communist Education, named uh, after Krupskaya, who was Lenin's uh, wife, for five years between 1920 and 1925. 
In addition to that, she was a full-time editorial bo board member for the famous avant-garde publication Lief and later New Lief Art Journal. In 1924, she also became a professor of the textile department at the highest art technical workshop for the mass. Between 1924 and 25, along with Lyubov Popova, she worked at the first cotton printing factory. In 1925, she was a participant in the Soviet pavilion of the International Fair and applied in the industrial arts in Paris. Uh, she couldn't go there. She was sitting at home with a new daughter, and her husband, Rochenko, went there to Paris. And um, in her diary, there are wonderful exchanges between them about how women in Paris don't have boobs and hips and like Russian women and, and they're really much better to have. <laughs> so, um, so she submitted in this pa uh, Paris exhibition to the departments of theater, textile, publishing and graphic design and probably was the most presented and in interdisciplinary artist there. Stepanova's catalog essays and lectures show her complex and changing relationship to the notion of the artist and art in these first few years because artists were tasked in developing this idea of what art can be for workers, can, how can it change. It became clear that claims to utilitarianism and technicism in, in art were exaggerated and uh, by her and her colleagues in constructivism in order to, on the one hand, respond to these governmental pressures to reinvent art as labor and to make it relevant to the working class and the industry, and on the other hand, respond to the modernist art coming from romantic, mystical, and art for art's sake positions which were held by the majority of her contemporaries. And I think during reading the discussions among them, it's very clear that just like Pussy Riot, it's a, it's a small, it's a minority among artists who do this kind of work. And there were lots of artists who did not buy um, uh, whether Bolshevik desired to make uh, art for the workers or art by the workers, and those heated discussions played themselves out throughout the history <coughs> of Soviet Union. Simultaneously with arguing for inventions in painting, painters were joined by many non-painters and even non-artists, supported by the new governmental cultural institutions with a name to invent new art. And this particular support, I think, is also important that Lunacharsky provided not only with, uh, with uh, an impetus and, and um, uh, like ideological program, go and invent that, he gave them money Right? He set up institutions. There was funding. And uh, in particular, it relates to issues of where to work. That's the famous uh, room where Stepanova and Rochenko did most of their work. Um, this house was given by Lunacharsky. Right? They were given, artists were given housing and w w places to work at a time when there was practically no money. Right, so um, there was a, a, a concerted effort to support this activity. In the entry to her diary on March 5, 5 uh, 1920, Stepanova discusses the future synthesis of various art forms, arguing that unlike sculptors, painters are more flexible with media and inclusive of those who strive to invent new ways of creating. She argues that experimentation and research in the visual arts have the potential to discover new ways of organizing life as a whole and not just to be it in a museum. So I quote, Russian art, it, it is in the street, in the square, the city, and the whole world. Visual art making will discover new opportunities, will synthesize with other art forms, and we can expect from it to achieve the yet unknown and yet incomprehensible synthesis of art that should overcome the disciplinary boundaries of all arts. These inventions are in jeopardy from the limited support that the visual arts have, Stepanova complains, compared to other art forms such as literature, theater, or music. And similar to her colleagues in the prolet cult, proletarian culture mo uh, movement, she rejected the individualist approach to art making, insisting on the collective quality of art production. 
Quote, he who thinks that he knows subjectively based on his own individual learning process does not comprehend the component of collective creativity of individuals for working in a group. Here Stepanova makes an assertion that was only uh, uh, to be widely acknowledged much later in the 20th century when the artists themselves, including ones by Pussy Riot, talked about making an anonymous art, which would be not just an individual achievement, but a collective work. In this sense, she is not opposing an artist's studio practice, but is actually arguing that artists have always worked collaboratively. She undermines the notion of the individual genius struck by lightning bolt, bolt of sacred knowledge as a myth of an artist's guilt to keep their production processes away from the consumers of art. And those, uh, without simplifying things, because at the same time she writes about the importance of miracles and wonder in creative production. Right? So um, she was not oversimplifying and reducing it only to the collective. Um, Stepanova's art also produces and documents the changes that took place in women's lives after the revolution. And um, the major change which is demonstrated in her work is professional opportunities. Because apart from uh, this, this, was, this dress was a result of her <coughs> working on textile design. Um, and these are some of the designs they did for new sports, the idea of uh, women in sports, and I believe that you used one of those images in the publicity materials, right? These are the women standing in those designs in sports. And as I was looking at, at the 30s and 40s parades images that they um, uncannily remind of uh, the Stepanova's early designs. I mean, come to think of it, at one of those parades, I was wearing something similar to this. Um, and uh, going, some of the scholars who wrote about this, and there are very few who even touch upon not so much the design itself, but the woman who is standing there, and what it means in the 20s, what it meant to be dressed like that and to stand like that, what kind of idea of a new Soviet woman it represented, that I, I think sometimes, um, uh, I mean, sometimes claim and very often claim the whole idea of backwardness, how the masses were against this particular, uh, you know, undressing, you might say, right, and how they protested it. Um, what I would like to emphasize is, uh, these are some of the other, um, design she did for Merhold Theater. Well, I would like to emphasize the activities uh, the people are in. Um, <coughs> and specifically, I scanned here for you one um, magazine, which uh, one journal, it's called Book and the Revolution, um, that she designed in um, 1930. And you would see here, what we, what we see, it's a kind of quintessentially a Bolshevik and then Soviet attempt to, inro to rope in women into that particular Soviet production and the result of it. So here it says that these women are participants of the uh, cultural demonstration in a <coughs> in a village somewhere in the middle of Russia, and the sign here says, woman fight or struggle for, for culture. <coughs> so these women are struggling for culture, and on the other side of this um, cover of the book and the revolution magazine, by the, uh, which was supported by the government, and again, Krupskaya was on its editorial board. Um, you see examples of activities, different professional activities of what Bolsheviks wanted women to see, right? So what do they do? One of them is uh, the woman in the middle, right, who is standing there. She's a director of a textile factory. So this woman is a, like a <coughs> uh, party candidate right, who goes to the union meetings. Right, 
the, this w these women are on tractors there, so they are part of a uh, tractor team, right? agrarians. That woman on top, it's a woman who is sitting on top of that horse, so she's an engineer, agrarian engineer. She's teaching those other women um, how to farm, I guess. And this woman is, I have no idea how to translate it, Vartizanka Krasna. Uh, maybe someone would help me. It's someone who is fighting for the Red Army, basically. She's a soldier. She's a subversive soldier. Okay. So um, this is something what Stepanova made to design, right, to decorate this particular issue of this magazine. <coughs> now a little bit about this concerted effort to create this new woman. Uh, Trotsky wrote, uh, Trotsky and Kalantai, right, uh, uh, together with a few others, were, they were very eager to see that the old tr traditional ideas of the family would be destroyed and that at the end of the Bolshevik de deca decade, the Soviet woman was no longer simply a private citizen. And that's another, um, I think, argument which I presented in my earlier work that it was a certain level of politicization of women's position in the Soviet Union, that it's no longer they are citizens in relation to or family members in relation to their family members, that they become directly involved, and many have argued the same thing, that they have become directly involved in public life. Um, she has become socially engaged and politically active, and these are some of the attempts of making her socially engaged and politically active. Um, I thought that with all the discussion on gun debate, you would find this really nice image how um, in a paternalistic way men are helping women to handle a gun. My colonel teacher spared us girls from handling gun with the Soviet Union. Um, despite of many setbacks, especially due to this exploitative nature of Bolshevik gains for women, the changes were enormous and became part of the new subjectivity, at least in terms of education and professional opportunities. And it was reflected in Stepanova's everyday life. At one, uh, many anecdotal entries exist in her diaries about this pre uh, both liberatory potential and the pressure she feels of being a new woman. Uh, when they are discussing gender relations in the Caucasus, Stepanova, Sergei Tretikov from New Left and Rochenka uh, are talking in 1928. Tretikov is saying that young men complain to him that women don't want them any longer. Rochenko explains to Tretikov, says Stepanova, that Tretikov and those men who do not understand that situation has changed. Women are not economically dependent any longer. They will choose what or whom they want now. They do not need to get married any longer so that they have become more selective. Women today study, they dress professionally, they have their own communities and they do physical exercise. Um, men, on the other hand, cannot show much of this new development. Women have benefited from the new public life. They've realized they need to, to be in charge of their own lives. And here it becomes even unclear where there are words of Stepanova and where there are um, <coughs> words of Rochenko and Tretyakov. It's wrong to say that women are weak and therefore men should support their development. Only women can change their own position in society, end of quote. Um, there, there was a, uh, for the sake of time, I will skip the legislation. However, in, the, in my other work, and others have done this work, that the legislation of the first few years, what it tried to do, it tried to decouple the previous power of the church from um, uh, from uh, everyday life in the Soviet Union. So 1917, we have decree, 1917, December, right? The revolution happened in October. In December, we have decree on the introduction of divorce, where one could divorce just like that. Nice. 
1918, uh, a code of concerning the civil registration of deaths, births, and marriages happened, where marriages which, which were done by the church previously were all became unconstitutional and illegal, and now people needed to go and to um, uh, be affirmed that they are married again by the Bolsheviks. Uh, also, it was a uh, really new, was considered uh, pretty liber liberatory uh, legislation at the time because Bolsheviks equalized marriages and civil unions at some point. And of course, there were lots of protests from peasants about that. They resisted that law of 1926 marriage. And the children who were born in such civil unions were equalized in their rights with uh, children from marriage marriages. See. So despite of this ongoing discussion in the scholarly literature about the nature of changes, Stepanova surely operated under no illusion that her work could be um, deemed dangerous if she questioned the power too much. Many of her friends were imprisoned and killed during the 1930s, including Sergei Tretikov, with whom that dis lovely discussion about men and women in the Caucasus took place. Um, it was a tragedy that this new art forms and these new art forms were quickly found to be offensive. However, they did proliferate in everyday life through print media and design. Stepanova was often also the main breadwinner in the family during this time. They lived with a generation of three, three generation of women, with families surviving often on her graphic design work. Her work also shows integration of the notion of the new woman with a limited scope of ability to self-determination and to determine by herself what this new subjectivity meant. While legally on paper, women have been given opportunities in this new public sphere, the sphere itself has been becoming more and more restrictive. The power of the family and husband been eroded and re through erosion of the religious institutions, but among fellow artists and political life, there have been other institutions that police <coughs> everyone and each other, not just women artists. And here is my point, that the general politicization of women's subject position and how Stepanova more or less participated in this process. Thus, Pussy Riot can claim a long history of women's revolutionary movement, which started long before the October Revolution. <coughs> In the work, um, uh, and this particular politicization has other forms too, like for example in the way in which retirees, um, particularly women retirees, protested in Moscow. They were uh, a very successful group, one of a few successful groups who demanded and changes were not implemented. And um, when Moscow Biennale happened, the first Moscow Biennale, uh, my friends from other countries who went there were complaining that they couldn't walk into the main um, revolution museum because there were some old women standing there at the minus 20, 30 degrees Celsius uh, with these banners demanding uh, that their um, uh, pension benefits would not be monetized. Uh, and we're not only witnesses, what I'm trying to say here, but also participants in this production of this new Pussy Riot woman. And I would like to end with a discussion of the more recent reaction, um, and especially from groups like Moscow Actionists and fellow artists. Anatoly Asmalovsky, whose work was very important in the 1990s and who did participate in street actions in Moscow too, like in this 1968 tribute and in the against all parties movement where they were trying to make sure that people vote against all. Later it was taken away from the ballot. And he speaks, one of the very few artists currently who supported openly, not just Pussy Riot action, but also the aesthetic, the act itself of an artwork. He talks about the way in which he is in awe of them. The fact that um, he says, I admire this work by Pussy Riot. I admire it because of its courage. We artists have been systematically represented have been systematically um, uh, abused in the last 10 years by the church activists and by the authorities. 
Two of our key actionists had to leave the country, Alek Movramati and Taraganyan. He says, I tried to defend them, including in court, and remember how hard it is to deal with our legal system. The curator of uh, an exhibition on Alchuk could not bear the trial of the Danger Religion uh, trial exhibition. It's prescient she committed suicide in Germany, and it was a personal tragedy to me, too. I knew Anna. Then another exhibition, Forbidden Art Curators, were tried again and fined. That's the exhibition in which previous Pussy Riot members protested. And then Smolovsky says, men after this started thinking how to proceed, how not to make the situation worse. But women did it. This direct confrontation has had a huge effect. Their work is statically so much taking after Malevich with the explosion of color is really well done. It is really well thought through action, prepared, and only those who are not part of the art process can miss that. But the main part of this action is its heroic element. They are heroines, and I am in awe. I was tried before as an artist and know how awful the state apparatus is when it comes after you. But they have done so well in court, they were so focused. It's not that one is tortured during the trial, but one becomes part of the system. By the fall, end of quote, by the fall, Putin knew exactly all the works which Pussy Riot did before, right? The, as a part of the group war, he, 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 he knew uh, their previous works. He referred to them during his interviews. He portrayed them as racist pornographers and make them even more famous in a way. Uh, he also supported this violent protests which, t which have been taking place now on a constant basis against contemporary art and LGBTE and ecological activists in Moscow. Here we see, um, if you notice this church activist, right, as they um, uh, are now called, and you can see them on this left top f uh, photograph how uh, one of the priests is uh, blessing this young man to go and beat up and be violent with um, uh, homosexual uh, gay activists in Moscow. And on the right, uh, this photograph said that this particular, you can see that this looks almost like the same man, right? They are putting a spear through um, the face of whom they thought was Madonna. When, remember, she... Um, uh, then we had a documentary screened on the national television almost immediately after Pussy Riot case in, in the church. Tried to discredit them as the agents of, uh, 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 of pro-American and anti-Russian movement. And here they've become part of the protest movement in uh, last year. Right. So before I finish, I would like to finish with a story. In 1989, I had a heated discussion with one of my aesthetics professors at that philosophy department in Moscow State University. It was about two movies, Little Vera and Intergirl. It was the first time when we were shown the first sexual act in the USSR. And the other film revealed how we had not only sex, but even prostitution. There was a beginning of the whole aesthetic of shock therapy, and I argued with the professor that I don't want that shock therapy. Uh, it was probably my only f uh, f uh, memorable argument during my studies at that department. I was offended by that uh, a director who was trying to force on me shocking images which were supposed to show me, the stupid Soviet girl, how things were really bad in real life in Soviet Union. This professor of mine was arguing that probably our society needed to go through such shock therapy and others might find these revealing scenes about sex in small dirty spaces and little hope for the future pretty useful. He was arguing passively, but he was suggesting something totally new, the freedom of expression on the part of the artist. I disagreed with him and this professor who is now a head of Moscow philosophy department he is the one uh, under whose direction that um, Telakonikova finished that honors thesis and also been excluded together with a few other members of the 
uh, Pussy Riot and War Group. And I would like to read, uh, finally, from a John Coates' book about giving offense. The censor acts or believes he acts in the interest of a community. In practice, he often acts out the outrage of that community or imagines its outrage and acts it out. Sometimes he imagines both the community and its outrage. I cannot find it in myself to align myself with the censor, not only because of a skeptical attitude and part temperamental and part professional toward the passions that issue in taking offense, but because of the historical reality I have lived through and the experience of what censorship becomes once it is instituted and institutionalized. Nothing in either my experience nor my reading persuades me that State censorship is not an inherently bad thing. The ills it embodies and the ills it fosters outweighing in the long run and even in the medium run, whatever benefits may be claimed to flow from it. Thank you very much.